<laughs> okay, <laughs> we're almost ready to start. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Amy Karanik. I'm a Sculpey brand ambassador and I'm in the Sculpey um, studio today uh, for this beginning, everything you need to know about getting started with oven baked clays from Sculpey. And so the first thing I wanna do is just encourage you if you have questions, please type those in the chat and Jen or I will answer them. And I just wanna start with giving us like um, a quick rundown of what our different brands are about, when to use them, how to use them, how to use them in your home and um, what's the best projects to use with each one. So we're gonna do a lot of talking um, this way today as I introduce our brands. So this is Sculpey 3. And Sculpe, this is like one of our packs, multi-packs of Sculpey 3. This is 31 ounce bars. And Sculpey 3 is our basic beginner entry level um, oven bake clay. And what I mean by oven bake is all of our clays bake in a home oven at around 275 degrees for 20 to 30 minutes um, based on the brand. And so it's really quite instant gratification because you can just cure it in your home oven. Um, oven baked clays are not water-based, so you can work on them over time in your, in your own home and bake it when you're ready to make it permanently hard. So this is Sculpey 3. It, as you can see, comes in lots and lots of bright, awesome colors. You can use them right out of the package or you can mix them to make your own custom colors. And today in Sculpey 3, we are going to uh, be making this little dish. Now the things, the types of projects that Sculpey 3 are good for, um, it's soft and workable. So it's easy for beginners to use. Um, it's not as strong as some of our other clays I'm gonna talk about. So when working with Sculpey 3, like this is a little child's hair barrette, but it's quite thick because Sculpey 3 needs a like a thickness to hold it st its strength. So that's a cute little idea. This is another little dish that I did in Sculpey 3. And you can see it kind of has a thickness to it, which gives it more support and strength. And I've incorporated some of our Sculpey 3 that has mica in it to make a real shiny um, look. Here's another project that we did in Sculpey 3. We made very thin little tiles, but we backed it on a wooden tray. And that gives the Sculpey 3 a lot of support. And so that is a nice project that can be done in Sculpey 3. Sculpey 3 also comes in two ounce bricks like this, or you can buy multi-packs of one ounce bars to get you started. So that is um, our Sculpey 3, and I'm just gonna put these things out of my way so that we can move on and talk about another brand. Okay, also we have um, Primo Sculpey. Now, uh, Primo Sculpey also comes in lots of different colors, and Primo is one of our premium clays. It has very saturated pigments. It might have some mica or some glitter in it. Um, it's really, really um, a very strong clay after it's baked. And so that makes it super good for jewelry items. You can see how thin these earrings are, but they're super, super duper strong. And jewelry takes a lot of, um, it, because it's a functional item, it takes a lot of beading that you might not even think about. And so I would always make jewelry items out of Primo Sculpey or out of Souffle. Um, Primo Sculpey also comes in a lot of colors that are made to be mixed, like cadmium red and zinc yellow, and color names that you might recognize from working with paint. And so that gives you the ability to custom mix colors with Primo Sculpey. Also, Primo has the ability to be polished and shine, like in this beautiful galaxy bead that Jenny Bazing made. And that is something different than um, you don't have to add any um, coatings to it or anything. You can just sand it, wet dry sand it and polish it to a high shine. And that is unique of Primo. So we are gonna set these out of the way. And then we're going to talk about souffle. Primo also comes in a two ounce bar and our branding is such that you can see the name Sculpey right here and then underneath you can see this says Primo. Um, Sculpey 3 comes that way and so does souffle. 
So those are some different ways of recognizing our brand. Now this is a multi-pack of half Primo and half souffle. And so the souffle side, you can see that the souffle, while it's also a premium clay, it's super strong after it's baked and somewhat flexible. Um, the souffle also comes in very fashion and trendy colors. And you can mix any of our brands together um, to create your own color palette. But keep in mind uh, that Primo and Souffle are the most um, premium ones. Those are the ones you're gonna wanna use for jewelry making. Let's look at a few samples of Souffle because it is totally different. This is a Souffle wrap bracelet that Cindy Holt made. It is so strong and flexible, it has a lot of memory to it. It feels almost like leather. And another thing about um, souffle is we always say that it has a suede-like finish. And so you can really tell when you meet these in person that it doesn't have any sheen to it. It's really nice and flat like leather. Whereas our Primo clay has a little bit of a sheen to it when it's baked. This gorgeous necklace um, was made by one of our design, design people here at Sculpey. And it's super lightweight because souffle has the ability to be strong and flexible but also lighter in weight than our other clays. So it makes it possible for you to make large jewelry items, um, you know, that you might not want to make, you know, with some of the other clays, cause it's so lightweight, flexible and strong, can hold its own weight. All right, so that is souffle. Let me set those out of the way. And then we'll move on to talk about some tips for using um, oven baked clay in your own home. So when you're using oven-baked clay, you might think, well, what am I gonna work on? We never want oven-baked clay, to raw oven-baked clay to touch fine furniture. We don't want there to be interaction between um, our clays and fine furniture or varnishes. So here's some suggestions about what you can use to work on in your home. This is a silicone mat that I picked up at Michael's. It's actually for resin, but it would be perfect for oven-baked clay. Um, oven baked clays won't interact with silicone and so this would be a great work surface and would be easily cleaned. You can also work on ceramic tiles which you can get at any big box store and they come in a multitude of sizes. You can work on an oven on, on a ceramic tile. You can also bake on ceramic tiles. So it kind of has a dual purpose. If worse comes to worse, you can always work on copy paper. Now you could tape this down on a work surface and it would create a nice barrier between whatever you're working on and your clay. You'd want to use several thicknesses, but this is porous. So over time, some of the um, plasticizer in our oven baked clay might leach through it. And I'll show you an example of that. So you would want to trade this out periodically and not count on it to be a permanent barrier like you would ceramic tile or a silicone sheet. Um, let me look here and see. You can also work directly on a laminate countertop, which is what I use in my studio. Uh, laminate countertop is just like your standard kitchen, you know, um, countertop covering. You could also work on glass. Um, if you want to. So those are some ways that you can work on oven bake um, clays in your home. Next, let's talk a little bit about storage. And I have this whole storage display set up for you. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. <laughs> she just beamed this in. <laughs> okay, so for storing oven bake clay, because oven bake clay goes a long, long, long way. And so once you've opened it, you wanna kind of keep track of it. You wanna know what your colors are and you wanna keep it um, free of dirt. And so in office supply stores, there's all kinds of plastic bins that are work really well for storing oven baked clay. So let me show you what I've got going in here. Um, I've got some opened clays already in this bin. And for example, over here in this corner, um, believe it or not, this is the way I store clay at home. <laughs> I don't rewrap it or anything. I don't care if the clays touch each other. That doesn't bother me. If I get a little yellow on my blue, I'll just, you know, scrape it off there and keep going. I don't mind if my clays touch each other. The main thing is just keeping it um, in a position where it's not going to attract dust, dirt, and, you know, like animal dander, okay? You just want to keep it clean. It's not going to dry out. Um, I've even got some little, you know, bits of mixed colors in here. If you want to, you could rewrap it in the wrapper it came in so that you can know um, the colors. 
The main thing might be just to keep your Primo and your Souffle Sculpey um, away from your Sculpey 3 so that you know that you've got your strong ones on one side and your Sculpey 3 on the other. But, you know, here's some examples of clays that I've just rewrapped with the name on there and the baking time and temperature. You might want to keep those handy until you really become acquainted with it. Um, if you have pieces of clay that you've pre-mixed, this is a kind of a cool little way. My friend Kathy Weaver showed me these. These are treat bags, plastic treat bags. And I just slit one side of them open so that I could lay some of my cool mixtures of clay in there. We're gonna make this one today on camera. Um, that way, I, those don't go to waste. They're reusable and that just keeps them clean and flat. Hey, um, Amy, yes. Can you um, answer this question? Yeah. Does the clay have a smell? To me, it does not. <laughs> I've been at, I've been, my had my hands on oven baked clay for over 30 years. And to me, there's no smell. <laughs> I have heard people with very sensitive noses say they can smell it, um, but not, not to my way of thinking. Um, there could be a slight odor when baking, but to me, there again, I always work in a well ventilated area with a, a fan on as I'm baking. So it doesn't, I don't notice anything. Um, also, another thing you could use just typical snack bags from the kitchen area. You could also wrap things up in um, kitchen wrap. Any type of kitchen wrap is fair game. So those are the ways that you can store your open oven clay. And I'm going to hand this back to Jen. Thank you, my lovely assistant. <laughs> and that's how you can store oven baked clay. Okay, let me check my notes here to make sure I'm getting everything you need to know. So. I talked briefly about mixing and you can mix all of our brands together to get your own um, consistency, your own feel, your own um, color palette. You, that's all fair game to mix them. However, if you're gonna make something that requires a super strength, which we are gonna show later in this video, this is a bangle bracelet and it's somewhat flexible. Bangle bracelets take a lot of wear and tear and they need to be a little flexible to get them over your big hand and down on your skinny wrist. I would never use that with Sculpey 3 or any amount of Sculpey 3 mixed in. This is all Primo and Souffle, our strongest clays. So um, yes, you can mix and match all the clays that you want to for whatever reason you want, but just keep track of the ones that are stronger, okay? Also, you can use oven baked clay with paint. And this is just a glossy gray paint that I silk screened onto a piece of white clay. I just did this yesterday. It's still super flexible. And that's a beautiful little veneer of one of our silk screens, our feathery silk screen. It's got a splash of other um, bits of clay on top for decoration, but you can also use acrylic paint with our clay. And this is dry. Um, I silk screened it on there and then let it dry. That can totally go in a home oven for curing. Um, the paint, paint and all can go right in the oven. So that is a beautiful thing. <laughs> okay, let's talk about one more tip. Um, we'll get onto the baking tips when I get to baking, but also I wanna show you a little bit about clays that become, uh, may over time become a little bit um, firmer to the touch or clays that are maybe out of the package are a little too um, squishy. And so what to do about that? This is some clay <laughs> that I uh, sheeted out yesterday and I've left it on this piece of paper to show you. Can you see those oil blots? That is the plasticizer leaching out into the paper. And so if you have clay that is really too squishy for your liking, you can leach it and let some of that um, some of that plasticizer go into anything porous like copy paper. Then what you could do is recondition it in your hands. And we're going to talk about more about conditioning in depth as we get going, but you could recondition it, see if it feels better to your, to your touch. And then you could either leach it more or you're good to go with your project. Now, another thing that you might be concerned with is if your clay is too firm. And if you get a clay that is a little crumbly or too firm, what you can do is you can um, soften it with our clay softener and conditioner. Clay um, softener and thinner is actually what it's called. It's a liquid that comes in a one ounce bottle. And what I would do if I was going to 
um, soften a lump of clay is I would kind of patty it out and then create a little well. And then I would just put one or two drops of our thinner in there and work that completely in by hand or through a pasta machine. Like if you're gonna use a pasta machine, you would always set this up on, the, on a thick setting. Oh, I dropped my handle. You can condition clay through a pasta machine as well. And the way you do that is to push the clay through and then fold it in half. And you always put the fold side through first. When you put the fold side through first, that presses air bubbles out through the open end. And so that is good, um, you know, pasta machine technique. And so, uh, that is also another way that you could use um, a machine to help you work that thinner in. Okay, so that's clay thinner and softener. That's for softening. And then leaching the clay, that is for firming it up. Hey, Amy, can yes. you talk really quickly? If someone has original Sculpey, can you talk a little bit about original Sculpey? Oh, okay, so like for like white, the, the white Prima, kind? The oh, okay. Terracotta. So original Sculpey, um, comes in white, terracotta, and granite. gray granite, or granite, and it comes in a bigger bulk, so you get a lot of it for your money. Um, because it's not colored, um, it's a little less expensive per ounce. Now, uh, to my way of thinking, original Sculpey is maybe even a little, um, it's very soft and easy to work with, and it's nice for making big items, like maybe a, um, a large planter or vessel, but it doesn't have the strength of our premium clays like Primo and Souffle. Um, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. I would say it's maybe even a little less strong than Sculpey 3. What do you think? You think it's equal to Sculpey 3? or? Equal. Okay, so right from, from Jen's mouth, um, it would be more the strength consistency of Sculpey 3. Um, it's, so a lot of people use it to make larger items that then are gonna be painted because um, it's only in one color. So it's great. I, the, the projects I've made with it would be like um, a large thick vessel, um, like for a planter or to put a planter pot inside of. Um, I've made thick tiles with it that had a lot of detail um, and then covered it with um, paint or maybe even a liquid sculpey glaze. So um, Christmas, ornaments. Christmas ornaments, yeah. School projects. School projects would be good for original Sculpey mm -hmm. because it comes in a bulk. Basic sculptures. Quantity. A lot of people start ba with basic sculptures. Original Sculpey before they step up to super. Sculpey. Yeah, yeah. So original Sculpey is a really great entry level, basic beginner product because you can get a lot of it for less money, and um, it's super easy to work out some skills of sculpting and uh, clay manipulation with original Sculpey. So just checking my checklist once again, and we're gonna talk about the baking pretty soon. So I'm gonna talk about conditioning as well as I move along, but I think we'll start on one of our projects because that will get my brain going about what else to talk about. So Ash, if you don't mind to spotlight my overhead, thank you so much. These are the colors we're working with here, and this is gonna be Sculpey 3. And what I have here is a little dish and it's kind of thick so that it can stand alone and be used as um, Sculpey 3. Um, this is pretty sturdy. If I tried to, if I tried really hard, if I dropped it on the floor, it probably would not um, break. But if I tried to break it by stepping on it, then it would. <laughs> but it's good for what it's made for. It's kind of the equivalent of a, like a little ceramic dish. So it's a cute little stash dish. And I'm going to show you how I made that and how I sort of marbled the colors together. These are the colors we're using. This is Pearl Sculpey 3 and Purple Sculpey 3, and this is Teal Pearl Sculpey 3. So the purple is a flat color and the Teal Pearl and the Pearl both have some mica in them to give them a little shine, which I really like. And you might've noticed when I brought the clay over here, I had this little paper barrier um, that I had the clay sitting on so that it didn't mark my wooden table. And, um, I'm working on a surface that will keep me from ruining my butcher block as well. So the recipe for this piece is half of a two ounce bar of the, um, of the teal pearl, a quarter of a two ounce bar of purple, 
and a quarter of a two ounce bar of pearl. And um, the reason I used more um, of this one is because that was my favorite one and I wanted it to show up the most. But basically what I need to create this size of a dish would be about two ounces of clay. And I wanted to use them in different colors. So um, that's why I chose these three colors that work really well together. And I know they partially mix really into a pretty, you know, pretty style there. So right now what I'm doing is I'm conditioning the clay with my hands. And you can see that even from its uh, bar state that this clay is pretty easy to work with. You just condition it, get some of your body heat and your love moving through there, getting some energy going through that clay. And then once it's soft and pliable and all consistent, just move on to your next color. Now, a really great thing to have on hand for cleaning your hands between color is baby wipes. And they, it just really makes it easy to wipe away. Like if you get some color transfer on your work surface or on your hands, you can use baby wipes. So I'm moving on to the purple now and I'm just gonna keep um, hand manipulating it to make it soft and squishy and make it feel good and like it's ready to work. Now, when you're blending these colors together, it's very important that each of the colors be conditioned individually and get them equally ready to go. Okay, now I'm on to the pearl. Hey Amy, yes. I have questions about once you make a dish, can you put snacks in it? Mm, candy? Great idea, a great question. So they're talking about what you can put in this little dish. You could put any wrapped candies. Um, you could even put unwrapped candies if you want. It's completely non-toxic and it's, it's not food safe. So know that it doesn't have the food qualification grade, but it is completely non-toxic. So um, just to be fair, wrapped candies are great. I do put um, vitamins in mine from time to time and I just stash them in a drawer in my, in my bathroom so that I can see what colors the vitamins are. And I rinse it out every now and then. So it is waterproof once you're done. Um, but remember, it's not food safe. So what I'm careful about is to not stain the piece of art that I've created. So I always say you can put candy and dry things in there, but don't serve spaghetti in it because <laughs> that will stain your dish and you don't want that. So put anything in there that doesn't stain it. All right, I have all three of these ready to go. Another way to condition clay, if you're having a little more, if you don't have that, you know, motor skill of that, is you can always roll clay into a rope and then fold the rope. You might have a little bit uh, more hand strength if you do it in that method than in just squishing in can your you palms. Can you talk a little bit about air bubbles, like conditioning in your hands, will that create air bubbles? Um, air bubbles? Okay, so conditioning in your hands does not create air bubbles as long as you use good technique. And so what I mean by good technique is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna patty this way out and then fold it. I will trap air bubbles in there if I do that. I'm gonna keep this really compacted, trying to keep my hand, my fingerprints out of it. So now that I've I patted it out flat, I gotta get it back compacted. Because you can see air bubbles in there. If you get an air bubble, um, I would really encourage you to pop it with a needle tool and then you know, work that area back. But let's start over with this fresh bar. So not getting air bubbles in it is like conditioning by pressure, not conditioning by spreading. Okay, condition with pressure in a log or in a ball, but not by spreading. And that will keep you from getting air bubbles. If you need to condition by sheets like this through a pasta machine, then like we talked about before, always folding the sheet and putting the fold through the machine first. Always put the fold through first so that the air has a chance to get out through the open side. So as I'm conditioning this way, I'm always working toward moving everything in a compacted motion. Um, I'm not really folding this, I'm just pushing from the, in, from the outside in because you really do wanna keep the air bubbles in check. All right, now just to move on, I'm going to kind of, um, and there's an air bubble right there. So I'm gonna pop that. 
but I really don't see any more. So I'm going to combine my colors into a very compacted log. So I have all three colors there going. And then I'm going to give this some hand strength. So what I'm going to show you is a marbling technique. And this is just one marbling technique. There's probably as many marbling techniques as there are people that are using clay. So feel free to use your favoriteest one. This is just me putting a lot of pressure on these three colors and making them sort of one solid unit. Now I'm gonna roll it a bit and I'm gonna twist just a little. I'm not gonna twist a lot because for this little marble dish, I do not wanna create stripes. I just wanna create a very random and almost organic type of pattern. So I don't want a lot of twisting. Next, to make it more compact again, I'm gonna roll this up real tightly like so into sort of a nautilus. And then I'm gonna give it more of that hand pressure. And at this point, I'm gonna do this a lot. And I want you to see, I'm just hand to hand, mudging this around, making it. What's happening is the colors are um, getting less and less, the, the line between each color is getting less defined and more wiggly squiggly. And that way we get some partial blending on the edges between the purple and the pearl and the teal pearl and the pearl and then the, the teal and the purple. So we're just trying really hard to get some interaction between those colors without making, um, you know, actually stripes. Okay. And then if I want to, I could treat it the same way I did before when I was conditioning. I could move colors in from the outside in to make even more of that marbling happen without mixing the colors completely. Amy, can you talk a little bit about how to keep fingerprints off your finished project? Um, well, that can happen as we go along. Um, I am not. I'm not a person who cares a lot about fingerprints on my art because it is art. And I feel like my fingerprints are kind of a signature <laughs> that I made them. But I will talk about that as we, as we go. I'm gonna show you some techniques that really help smooth the surface of the clay and that would address that problem. So thank you for bringing that up. That is a good, some people really are concerned about that. And so we will talk about it in just a couple strokes. Okay, so see how I got like tons and tons of uh, blue pearl and not a lot of purple. What I want to do is cut that open and see what's inside. And now I can see there's kind of more purple. And so um, I'm liking that. And so I'm going to basically turn these two pieces of clay inside out, but I'm keeping it super compacted. So I'm not trapping air, keeping it really compacted. And then I'm just going to do this again. So sometimes you'll have a color um, that will sneak into the interior of that ball. And if you wanna grab it back, you can just cut the ball open and find it. Okay, um, the more and more and more I do that hand to hand to hand action, the more those colors are gonna blend, but I feel like we kind of need to move on. So I wanna show you what to do next, okay, to form the bowl. All right, next I'm gonna bring in this little piece of paper, because I kind of don't want my, my big wad of clay to stick to my work surface. Um, sometimes I want it to stick and sometimes I don't. And so this is one of those times when I don't. And so what I'm gonna do is bring this over onto a little, um, this is like the kind of paper that people uh, patty out hamburgers on. It's like a little wax deli sheet. And so I'm gonna roll this flat and I wanna get it going to about, um, about like a, a fourth of an inch thick, quarter of an inch thick. And I'm trying to keep it round. That's why I'm moving around. And that's why this deli sheet is so handy is because I can keep moving it and orienting it in a different direction from my eye, um, you know, and keep it in a circle. Now, obviously when I'm rolling like this, I'm also eliminating fingerprints. So that's one way if, you're, if your design lends itself to being rolled, 
um, the roller will eliminate fingerprints. Let's turn it over and see how the back looks. At this point, I want to decide um, what the interior of my bowl will look like versus the exterior. So you just basically pick your favorite side and mine is this one. So I'm gonna call this my interior from now on because when you look at a bowl, um, you obviously see the inside in a big, in a, like an open vessel like this, you see the inside way more than the outside. So I'm gonna call this my, the inside of my bowl. I'm just gonna give it a couple more good luck rolls here. And then I want to flip it upside down because I want to preserve this as the inside of my bowl so it goes face down. Okay. Now, at this point, if it's not real round, um, you can round it out with your fingertips. Okay. And just make sure it's kind of, you know, a super circular shape. You can also stretch it a bit in areas where it might not be so, you know, round. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we'll, we'll roll this one more time for good luck. Then I'm going to take my thumb and I'm going to apply a lot of pressure here on the edge. Okay, I want to back up a second and show you some items that we need to consider. You need to consider what style form you have. This was baked on a form because baking it on a form made it, forced it to take the shape of the form, and then it's gonna keep that shape forever. So you wanna think about what kind of form you have. And ceramic dishes make good forms. This one happens to have a flat bottom. So if I use that as a form, my dish will have a flat bottom. Um, a wine glass can be a good form. In this case, I would probably form the dish on the outside of the glass and it would still have a flat bottom, but I would probably, because it'd be too hard to work on the inside. So if you have a wine glass on hand, that would be a nice form. In that case, um, you just need to know if you're forming your, your bowl up from the outside or from the inside. Um, just think about that a little bit ahead of time. And we'll go ahead and, you know, pinch that down. Um, I want to show you another good idea for a form. This would be a good form. You could use the inside or the outside of this, but it's going to give you a very rigid edge on your, on your bowl and not such a gentle slope. Okay, so you want to think about that as well. If I were working on the inside of the bowl, I would probably want to form my lip with the uh, inside facing me, but since I'm going to work, well, no. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Just think about that. Um, I think for either of these, we're gonna be good to, to pinch this lip down or this rim from this side. So anyway, I just want to point out that glass, metal, ceramic, um, any of those make really good forms because they can go in the oven at 275 without any change at all. And then, um, the clay won't stick to it permanently. You can pop it right off. You might have some items like that in your house already that you could use for forms. Also, it's great to look at garage sales and flea markets and thrift stores for potential forms for your clay projects. And just know that whatever, um, you know, whatever the, the uh, piece is made of, like this has sort of a um, frosted appearance it's not gonna change the look of the clay. Where you're gonna notice later when I pop this one out of the bowl, that because the bowl is so shiny, um, the bowl on the bottom, my clay bottom will be somewhat shiny. It will have picked up that super sheen. And we'll see that when I pop it out. Another thing you wanna look for is that you don't have like a big um, emblem or any etching in the bottom. If you have some writing or something engraved in the glass, that will be picked up by the clay as well. Okay, so now I have an edge or a rim facing downward um, on my dish. And I've obviously made tons, and not only have I made fingerprints, but I've made some unevenness. And so what I like to do is just go along with my finger and wipe that away. And this is another way to get rid of fingerprints on your art because my fingerprints not only left my prints, but they also left waviness and I wanna smooth that out. And so as I'm smoothing it, I'm also helping the colors to sort of blend and become more organic. 
So finger buffing is what I call this. And that is another good way to get to eliminate fingerprints if you don't want them. Okay, then what I like to do is just go back with my roller and reestablish that my bottom is really flat and nice. Get back in the camera here. Jen, can you give me a time check? It is 2.36. Okay, great. All right, so now I just wanna peel this off the paper and this is where this paper comes in so handy um, because it didn't stick to my work surface and I'm not damaging my, my cool disc by you know trying to scrape it up off this work surface. The paper just peels right away. So now what I wanna do is I'm gonna use the same bowl as, as this sample is in. And what you wanna do is just gently uh, lay it down in here as evenly as possible so that you have the same amount your rim becomes the same depth all the way around. And then just very carefully work this down from the middle till it touches the bottom. And then I'm, what I would do is I would really take some time to seat this down on that flat bottom. So no air is trapped between my clay and that flat bottom. So work right in the middle and then work outward. Make sure you've got clay down in that little, what would be at the corner of the bottom and the edge. Okay, and then what I can do, I'm making more fingerprints, so I can just go along with my finger buffing and really smooth that out. And then I can go up the sides and smooth it out too. Now, one more thing you can do to eliminate fingerprints is you could douse um, a cotton swab or a folded paper towel pad with a little um, rubbing alcohol and you could wipe the interior with that and that will pick up lint as well as smooth fingerprints. So uh, rubbing alcohol on a paper towel pad or um, cotton balls or, or uh, cotton swabs, any of those will eliminate um, fingerprints and dust and dirt. Okay, so that's ready to go in the oven. And for Sculpey 3, we bake at 275 for just 20 minutes and that's per quarter inch of thickness. So it doesn't matter how big the bowl is, it matters how thick it is. And we've only, we have not gone more than a quarter inch. So I would like to bake this at 275 for 20 minutes. Then when it comes out of the oven, all you have to do to release it is just take a dull tool that won't hurt the clay or the bowl and just stick it in here. And that's how easily it comes out, comes out of ceramic or glass or metal. And so that is just a cute little tiny dish. You could paint the rim with the bright silver paint if you wanted. And I don't know if you can tell, but there is a shiny spot right here where it came into contact, really hard pressure with the bowl. There's a few shiny spots around. Um, they're not glaring or anything, but it, if you had this in person, you could see that some of that shine where it really pressed hard against the ceramic, it's picked up the shine from the bowl. And so you wanna be a little careful about how you put things in the oven. If you put things on a shiny uh, baking surface, um, like a ceramic tile, it will pick up the shine when it comes in contact. But the way to avoid that is just, if you don't wanna shine, you could just put a paper barrier in place. Paper can go in the oven at 275, so that's not a problem to eliminate shine by lining pans or tiles with some paper. Okay, so there's that one. Let me clean my hands real quick. Amy, how thick do you think that bowl is? Um, this one, I think at the yeah. thickest, it's a quarter of an inch thick okay. down here at the base, but up at the, the sides, I'm it gets quite thin at the sides. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about making a bangle bracelet. And like I mentioned before, uh, bangle bracelets, earrings, things that you want to be more delicate, we really need to use Primo, Primo Sculpey or Sculpey Souffle. And the reason is they have so much more um, strength to them that they're almost slightly flexible and um, jewelry just really takes you know, a hard, Toll, like these earrings, you want these to be quite thin so that they're delicate when they, you know, drape from your ear. And so you want to be able to work with clays that are going to support themselves that thinly. So this uh, bracelet we're making has what we call a Mokume Gane pattern. And I want to quickly show you how that's done. Um, I have already sheeted my clay 
um, through a pasta machine to condition it and to make it about the second thickest setting on a pasta machine. If you don't have a pasta machine, you can totally roll your clay and this would be about a 16th of an inch thick. And now I'm piling my clays up and I'll show you my order here from the side. I've got the black on the top, frost white glitter, gray granite, and then 18 karat gold. This isn't actually black, this is poppy seed souffle. So all of these clays are super duper strong by themselves. Now I always put my darkest color on the top um, because it's the one that's gonna carry the details through the design. You can really see those black pops. And so that's why you wanna put the black on the top. That is gonna make your, your lines. First, I'm gonna thin this even more with my roller. I'm gonna thin it from both sides until it's double in length. So I started out with squares that were about one and a half inch by one and a half inch. And so now I wanna just keep rolling this until it's about three inches long or double in length. I'm just going for longer in one direction just to keep organized. And then I'm gonna cut this in half. This is a really common and fun way to use oven baked clay is called mokume gane. And you can make it as random or as planned as you want. And I just cut it in half and restacked it. So now I have double layers. And mokume gane, um, we borrow that from Japanese metalworking. Mokume gane means uh, wood grain metal because when you're done, it kind of has the look of. It can have the look of wood grain, but it was first initiated by metal smiths, metal workers. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to get this, I want to keep it growing this way. That's why I'm focusing more on, I'm putting a lot of pressure in this direction. And I want it to go this way about double the width of my bracelet. Okay. So I'm going to keep going in the same direction turning it end to end so that I'm kind of even about it. And I wanna keep going until this is about three inches long or three and a half inches long. So let me double check and we're there. So now I'm gonna cut this in half. I'm just eyeballing it and I'm gonna restack it. Okay, now it's not double my bracelet width. So I want it to be double my bracelet width again because I'm gonna get two pieces out of this. My bracelet requires two pieces. So I'm gonna concentrate my pressure on going this other direction because I already know that it's about three and a half inches. So now I wanna double the width again. And this project, these projects are published on Sculpey.com. You can download them for free and have the ability to follow along in printed form as well as, you know, step-by-step -step photos if you would like. Okay, so now I'm there again. And I've got, I'm about double the width of my bracelet. So that's cool. That's what I want. Now I'm just gonna shave off these outer edges just to remain organized and keep, um, you know, it just helps my brain work if I trim a bit. You don't have to trim that way at all. Now for this project, when I did that bowl, I wanted my bowl to be able to slip around on the work surface, but for this project, I don't. I like it to stick down. So I'm working on something that's a little bit sticky. Um, you should save this for creating beautiful, beautiful twists of clay. There's no scrap in clay, so keep it all. You'll find a way to use it. Now we're going to impress a pattern um, in this sheet of clay that's going to mimic this style pattern. We'll never, ever get the exact same pattern every single time, but we'll get one that's close and they'll all be beautiful. I'm going to use my needle tool and I'm going to start from this bottom across the bottom and I'm going to go about every three quarters of an inch. And I'm impressing deeply, but I'm trying really diligently to not bend my needle tool. That's why I'm putting pressure right here. 
I don't want to hurt my tools, but I want them to do what I want them to do. So I'm, I'm putting some pressure. And every time I put pressure with a tool, what's happening is I'm making these layers of clay um, go below the surface into the layer under them. So now I'm using the six millimeter ball tool and making just sort of a standard pattern, okay? And then I'm gonna come back this way and do the same thing. Hey Amy, yes. if someone has a bigger wrist, would they just use more clay or? Yes, they... yeah. so thank you for asking that question. What you wanna do is you wanna measure your wrist to know what your end point is. And the reason I made my sheet of clay three and a half is because I'm gonna cut it into two pieces and three and a half and three and a half equals seven. And seven is the standard for women's bracelets. They either go above or below seven, but they start as seven as the middle. So I'm actually gonna come out with a seven inch long bracelet. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see my marks too well, can you? No. Shoot. Okay, well, you will soon and you saw what I did. <laughs> okay, so what I have over here is like, I have this, um, going that way. And now I'm going to, I'm going to randomly cut into it with this little knife tool. I'm so sorry. You can't see that, but you're going to see it. As soon as I start shaving it away, you're going to see what happened. That's what you get for putting the black on top. Right. And then I'm going to go back in with another blunt point tool. And I'm just going to do some random dots. Hey, I wonder if this would help. Let me see if I can shine a light on it. Does that help at all? Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, see that little pattern I've got going in there? <laughs> now I'm going to go in here and make some blunt point. I'm not going all the way through my slab, I'm, but I'm going pretty deep. Um, I'm going probably more than halfway is what I'm doing. And if people don't have clay tools, they could use toothpicks. That's right. Or... Skewers, um, plastic cutlery, knitting needles, knitting needles scissors, um, screwdrivers, hex wrenches. <laughs> Do you remember that time we did the drunk junk drawer yeah. Mokume yeah, showing how to use everything that wasn't a tool? That's probably on our website. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, see that pattern? <laughs> I've got a pattern going there. Okay, now. What I want to do is I've scarred this thing up a lot. And now what I want to do is heal it. So I'm going to roll over it until a lot of those thin lines close back up. And even my bigger holes are going to get smaller. And I'll show you again what this looks like in just a second. So I'm really um, healing up a lot of those scars that I put in it, but not completely. Let me see if I can show you how how less <laughs> they are there. So, okay, now comes the fun part. What we get to do is shave the top layer away and that will reveal that cool pattern that we made. And we're gonna shave in the same direction as our stripes. We're shaving parallel to the stripes. So I'm gonna start with a really clean blade so I don't pick up anything on here. And I'm gonna shave from one side to the other. And this is another reason I want my clay really stuck down is for the shaving technique. Um, and you can see, see the clay raising up on the face of my blade shows you how thin the shavings are. And I'll, I'll pick it up here in just a second and show you. So there's, uh, these are like paper thin but you can see the beautiful scars that we put in it. This is save this beautiful scrap. That's how I made these other little bracelets is with all that scrap that I mounted on a background of clay. So now we just wanna keep shaving the surface layer of black off to reveal our cool pattern. And everywhere we made a mark in that black, it went below the other colors and made a black outline. And just imagine all the different color ways you could come up with, you know, this one's quite neutral, but you could totally go to your closet, pick out your favorite garment, make, your, make a piece of jewelry to match it perfectly, 
by incorporating those same colors. You could mix the colors. You could find colors right out of the package that match. It's truly just an endless cycle of creating and more creating. So I love it. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to just I'm going to get rid of this edge again, but I'm not getting rid of it because that scrap is all fair game. And I'm going to cut this edge and I'm going to cut these. I'm going to cut these at an angle parallel to those lines I did. And then what we want to do is just cut this in half so that I'll have two pieces to make my bracelet at least seven inches. Okay. All right. So now I've cut that in half. I've got two pieces. Now what I have is this piece of, this is actually scrap clay that I twisted all together. And I'm gonna use that to make this interior um, piece of clay that's gonna really give all of our beautiful parts on top some really beautiful um, strength and thickness. So I just wanna roll this to, um, to about, I wanna have a piece that's at least seven inches and we're well past that now. Okay, so now let me cut this to about seven inches. This is all scrap clay, so it has a lot of beautiful stripes in it, which would be super fun to use in another project. All right, now this is way too round, so I want to flatten it. I'm going to use my finger, my my thumb, and just really give it some pressure to sort of make it flat on the bottom, and then we're going to make it half round on the top because that will be a really strong structure for a bangle. And then I'm trying to get this super smooth by brushing it with my finger. The side's not flat enough. And then I'm going to go along. I've got my index finger here and my thumb here. And they're both at angles that are producing um, a beveled edge on the top and the bottom. I'm actually smashing that ridge of clay to my work surface to make a beveled edge. So it sits super flat on my wrist. And then I'm gonna go back and smooth these, okay? Here's another trick you can do. As I've done that, I've created some waves and I like to use the side of my blade and add pressure and that really helps pull those waves in, um, gets everything reorganized flat again on the side. So I'm pushing on the edge and then beveling over. And that gives me a really nice shape, okay? Next, what we're going to do, and I'm again, I'm past seven now because of all that pressure I've got. This is almost to eight inches now. Um, so I'm not too worried. I have plenty of clay. Um, I'm going to put this nice trimmed edge in the middle right here. This is going to be the middle of my bracelet. And then I'm going to line this nice angled edge right up to it so that they kiss each other right there. And this, this piece is too long, so I'm just gonna cut the scrap away. Now I'm going to um, push this over with my fingers. I'm using a lot of pressure to push this down to match the shape of that, you know, semi-circle, half-circle um, shape I have going there for my bangle. And I'm using a lot of pressure. And I'm making sure that this veneer of the Mokumegane is really, really joining hard to that. Um, framework underneath that I created in that scrap clay for the strength. Okay. Now here, if you don't want fingerprints to end up on this, you could use just, like I said, you can use this method of finger buffing and it's not going to smear the colors a lot. Um, this is a very organic pattern. So I think it's I think it's fine. You could also at this point, if you notice some stubborn fingerprints, uh, use that technique of dousing either a cotton ball or paper towel with alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and then, you know, getting rid of those. Okay, now you just need to decide how your ends should look. I'm going to cut these square at seven inches. And then every time I make a cut on a piece of jewelry, I go back and finger buff 
that cut out so that it doesn't pull it up. And I just have this really neat, beautiful, um, very neutral, very organic looking piece for the bracelet. Okay, just like the bowl, we need a form. And let's talk a little bit about bracelet forms. You could use, um, oh, it caught up. <laughs> that was yeah. funny. Okay. So for a bracelet form, you could use a metal can like this one. I've already measured this. This metal can is almost exactly seven inches in diameter, in circumference, in circumference. It's almost exactly seven inches. Um, you could use a, a clear bottle, a glass bottle for a form, or you could even, if you need to make a super tiny bracelet, you could use an empty roll like this. If you're going to use something porous like this one, you would want to border this with packing tape to make it nice and slick. Um, porous items have a tendency to pull plasticizer into them and they're harder to get free from the clay than if you border it with packing tape. So here's one I've already baked on this and I just wanna show you how easy it is to get off. And I want you to notice right here, I left a little gap and that's to make my bracelet adjustable, okay? So depending on how much gap you leave, you can, make an adjustable bracelet. If you don't want it to be adjustable and you wanna seal that gap closed, you can do that as well, but then you've gotta get it over your hand. So I have that little gap. Another way you can do this is you could make your bracelet super long. And when you come around the back, you could um, let the bracelet bypass itself like this. And then you'd have way more bracelet and, a, and still the adjustability. Okay, I'm gonna show you how to pop this off. It's so easy because it's this is non-porous metal bottle, so it just pops right off. And now you have this great, strong, but somewhat adjustable bracelet that's going to go right on over my big hand. <laughs> okay, so super strong and easy to wear because it's the Primo and the Souffle. So what you want to do is lay this on here. Sometimes I use just the type. The, the font that's on the bottle as a guideline for to keep it straight. If I can line all this up with the, you know, with the font or with the edge of the bottle. I must've cut this one shorter than seven. I measured and measured and I still came up short, but that's okay. It's still completely functional. And then what you'd wanna do is just go around and make sure that it's really stuck well to the bottle. Okay. And that there's no cracks or anything that's gonna cause a weakness. Just take some time and inspect it. All right, and then when you go to baking, and I have a baking tray here somewhere. <laughs> okay, when I bake an item like this, I don't, I don't want to lay that right on my baking tray because I don't want my bangle to get a flat spot. So what I do is I make a little cradle with a towel. I can lay the bottle on here and then the bracelet doesn't actually touch the tray. It's actually kind of hanging there because the, the cradle is keeping it up off the surface of the tray. And that's ready to go in the oven. There's absolutely no worries putting cloth in the oven, um, you bake this for at 275 for 30 minutes. So Primo and Souffle like to be baked for 30 minutes for the absolute most strength. Okay, so I don't know what time it is. It's three o'clock. Oh, three o'clock. So um, Ash, can we go back? Yes, Jen. I just want you to touch on one thing. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about how whatever the clay goes into the oven like? It comes yes, out so. Um, so here's the thing, Jen's saying, um, oven baked clay does not shrink. It does not expand. It doesn't change how it goes in the oven is how it comes out. It doesn't come out smoother. <laughs> you need to get it exactly the way you want it to look before you put it in the oven. It's not going to change in the oven unless you burn it by putting too much heat. Um, so how it goes in is how it comes out. And one more note is that if you're gonna use a vessel like this, you need to make sure the lid is off. Um, you do not wanna trap air inside this vessel that will, cause the air will expand inside the vessel. You always make sure the lid is off, but the clay will not expand or shrink. And that's why um, you wanna be careful about 
um, how it goes in. So, okay. <laughs> all right. So um, thank you for joining us for all things beginner Sculpey. Um, like I said before, I'm Amy Kranick. I'm a brand ambassador. We love to have you join us. We have cl classes um, most months of the year. You can check the Michaels website for the schedule. If you make something in your studio and you want to share it with us, just hashtag Sculpey and or hashtag Primo Sculpey, hashtag Sculpey3 and use the hashtag uh, make it with Michaels and we will pick up on what you're doing and we can be very inspired by your work as well. So <laughs> I think I've covered it all, right, Jen? And we're good to go. So thanks for joining and we'll see you next time. Bye, Ash. Thank you.